Hello, welcome to the introduction to proofs video for proof strategies, proof by contradiction. My name is Professor Michael Polyuk. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain the logic of a proof by contradiction. You should be able to produce a proof by contradiction. And you should be able to decide what proof technique, either direct or contrapositive or contradiction, is most appropriate for a given situation. I would like to start with a story about avocados and guacamole. Avocados are the, um, the, the vegetable you see in the top, and the guacamole is a sort of mix, uh, a dip, uh, that's made out of avocados. This story will help us understand how proof by contradiction works. So this is a true story. My brother-in-law is very good at making guacamole. He, he makes extremely good guacamole. And uh, he always uses the same recipe, he uses the same ingredients, and he always makes this beautiful um, dip. So one day I'm invited over for brunch and he says, oh, Mike, can you please pick up some avocados for me on the wake because I would like to make some guacamole. So I say, sure, and I, and I pick some up. So I bring him the avocados, he makes his guacamole the same way that he always does, and the guacamole turns out terrible. So the question is, what can we conclude about this situation? Take a moment to think, uh, what can you conclude? So because uh, my brother-in-law did everything the same way, he, used the, he followed the same recipe, he did everything he usually did, but the avocados were different, what we can conclude is that the avocados were bad. To put this in the context of math, if you understand every step of an argument and every step makes sense and is justified, but at the end you get something terrible, then you know that it must be the starting things that were wrong. This is how proof by contradiction works. Let's see this a little bit more formally. So if you're trying to prove that P implies Q and you want to prove it by contradiction, it goes as follows. Assume that P is true and assume that not Q is true. Next, after a series of logical steps that you trust, derive a contradiction. So if you trusted every single step along the way, what must have happened is you had a faulty assumption. It's okay to assume P, so it must be not Q that's wrong. So if not Q is wrong, you must know that Q is right. So this is how a proof by contradiction works. You start by assuming P and not Q, you derive a contradiction, and your proof is done. This is one of the strangest proof techniques we'll see. And we're going to see some examples to help get a sense of how it should go. We're going to look at three examples. One mild, the second one should say one medium, but it says one mild, that's okay. And one spicy. So one mild, one medium, one spicy. Before we see this example, I want to remind us of some definitions. So an integer x is even if there exists an integer k such that x is 2k, and an integer is odd if there is an m, an integer m, such that x is 2m plus 1. This is our definition of even and odd. On the surface, is it possible for a number to be both even and odd? Well, there's nothing in the definitions that prevent them from being the same. For example, we did not define a number is odd if it isn't even. We didn't say that. We said you have this one property if you're even and this other property if you're odd. As it turns out, you can't have anything that's both, but that requires a proof. So let's see that proof right now. So the theorem is if x is even, then x is not odd. And we'll prove this by contradiction. So assume for the sake of contradiction that x is even and x is odd. So the x is even is the assume p part, and x is odd is the not q part, right? It's not not odd, therefore it's odd. Now we need to make a series of logical steps that will lead us to a contradiction. 
So we unwrap some definitions. If x is even, there's an integer k such that x is 2k. And if x is odd, there's an integer m such that x is 2m plus 1. Now we've written x in two different ways. Let's use this to find a contradiction. So setting them equal, we have that 2k is 2m plus 1. Therefore, 2k minus 2m is 1. So k minus m is 1 half. Now what's wrong with this situation? Well, k and m are both integers, so their difference is still an integer. But 1 half is not an integer. So we've just written something as both an integer and not an integer. That's our contradiction. So we have these two double arrows that are smashing into each other. That's one way of representing a contradiction. It tells your reader that you've reached a contradiction and you can stop. A couple of features about this proof that are worth pointing out. Um, we tell the reader in the first line that we're going to assume for the sake of contradiction. There's a couple ways of saying this, but basically you want to signal to the reader, hey, something weird's about to happen. We're going to use proof by contradiction. And then by telling them that, they will understand why it is that your next two assumptions are so weird, because you assume P and not Q. If they were expecting a direct proof, this would be very uncomfortable. So we tell the reader that we're doing a proof by contradiction. And once we end up with a contradiction, an obvious contradiction like a number is both an integer and not, then the reader will know that the proof is over and that the theorem has been proved. We'll see a couple more examples of this. The second example I'm going to leave as an exercise for you. Um, you can, uh, what, what we want you to prove is that there are no natural numbers x and y with x squared minus y squared equals one. There's one mathematical idea you'll have to have. Start by assuming that there are natural numbers that do this and then derive a contradiction. There are many ways to prove this and there are many contradictions you could possibly come up with. Finally, we see our spicy example. This is a classic proof by contradiction and is one of the most beautiful proofs in all of mathematics. Well, it's not this lemma. This lemma we just need on, on the way. So this lemma says that if you have a, num a natural number that's bigger than one, then there's a prime number that divides it, right? Either the number is prime itself or there's a smaller prime that divides it. Here's a, a theorem that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And this proof is due to Euclid. Euclid was a textbook writer. Um, he wasn't uh, necessarily a famous mathematician. He uh, compiled a textbook. So this is kind of like attributing a theorem to Stuart or something. But this proof is extremely beautiful. So we're going to start with suppose not. This is another way of indicating to our reader that it's a proof by contradiction. So suppose that it's not true that there are infinitely many prime numbers. What does that mean? Well, it means that there are finitely many prime numbers. So we start by listing them out. So let P1, P2, all the way up to Pn be the list of all of the prime numbers. Our goal is to come up with a contradiction. And what we're going to contradict is that these are all of the prime numbers. We're going to come up with a new prime number, basically. Now we have this extremely clever step. To make this new number, which is the product of all of those primes on that list, and add one. This number is going to have very strange properties. The lemma tells us that there has to be a prime that divides this number. So since all of our primes are listed, it has to be one of the PIs that divide it. But something is suspect. If you try to divide n by pi, any of the primes on the list, you'll have a remainder of one. Because it's a product of a bunch of things, 
including pi, and then plus 1. So this is a contradiction. You can't have pi both divided and not divided. This proof is quite dense. Um, it'll take some time to think about it. Uh, you can try writing through some examples, um, but it is quite a beautiful proof. It's very compact. Um, you should think about why it's a beautiful proof. An additional note, um, the n that's produced in this proof is not necessarily prime. So for example, if you take the product of the first six primes and add one, you get a number which is not prime. You should think about why that's the case. 